What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. This was Operation Acid Gambit. Who was this guy, Carl <laughs> Muse? So Kurt Muse was a businessman living in Panama, and he started a rotary club, amateur radios, blah, blah, blah. But they were doing uh, signal intelligence, basically spoofing Noriega's communications. And then finally what happened was Noriega's military intelligence caught up with him at some point, and they arrested him for espionage. And he ended up in Modelo prison. If this guy's like an expatriate trying to overthrow throw a government. Why are we trying to rescue this dude? Well, now here's my example. Okay. So Modelo prison, uh, right on Modelo prison. This is actually on discovery channel. I think on history channel, um, they declassified it. So that was a rescue of Kurt Muse out of uh, Modelo prison, 1999 in Panama. And you were involved? Uh, <clears throat> I was a breacher on it. I'm the guy that actually blew the, the doors in on the, on the, uh, annex on top of the prison, went down to get him out. So, um, as we were coming in, if you can just imagine, um, we had a hit time of midnight on the December 20th. And about seven hours out, we got information intelligence that uh, we had been compromised. And again, um, you know what they say, loose lips uh, sink ships. Mm -hmm. So a couple of guys, you know, that live there, you know, called home to mommy and daddy, said, mommy, daddy, something bad's going to happen tonight. If I don't ever see you again, I love you. And like, you know, and then some other guy went down and is told all his Panamanian friends and family around the canal, hey, you guys don't want to be around here tonight. Something's going to happen, right? So, okay, that just alerted the, the enemy that something's going to happen tonight, right? And so we knew we were compromised because our snipers uh, were already deployed. They're in the wood line, the jungles, and they're watching. And they're like, oh, all of a sudden, Modelo Prison is being reinforced with uh, uh, Panamanian Defense Forces, Dignitary Battalion, Militia. Um, they're literally setting up 50 caliber machine guns on all the corners. They're reinforcing the Commandancy, the headquarters across the uh, street, uh, Noriega's uh, military headquarters. There's a lot of activity. And that that activity started to draw in civilians because they wanted to come down like they were literally coming in with lawn chairs and stuff, waiting up for the Mardi Gras parade or something, the Rose Bowl parade. Like what? And they're sitting on the on the on the sidewalks drinking and playing music, and suddenly you've got thousands of people around the target, right? And the target's being hardened, and we got to go get in there and get them, right? Because the reason we had to go is because oh yeah, the 82nd Airborne Division and Ranger Battalion are in flight already on the way. Right, so there's a big aerial signature in the sky. Timing, right? Yeah. And they're on the way. We can't turn them around because now the mission will be compromised, and it's a change. It's a game changer. So we've got to go. And what ended up happening was all we could do is slide the hit time H hour to 20 minutes to the right, zero zero two zero hours. And we went in. And I remember I was on a little bird, this little uh, MH6. You, you've probably seen the pictures of the small helicopter, like a flying egg. It's got the little pods on the outside, two guys sitting yeah, on the outside. Yeah, we'll put a picture of it in the corner of the screen. Yeah. Once you'll pull it up. And, uh, and so I'm on, uh, I'm on the first bird. There's four of us going to come in and we're going to land on the roof. And then I'm going to get off with my breaching charges. My job was to run over to an annex, which is about 10 by 10 square. Um, I had a door on the top, a steel door. According to CIA sources, it was a solid steel door. So I built the explosive charges to, you know, breach that door. And um, so I run up to the door. Well, let me back up. So as we're landing, okay, because of the weight of the operators and the equipment were taken in, which wasn't a lot, by the way, um, the, the initial helicopters, the, the original MH6s, um, the engines were the same engines they used for um, uh, irrigation machines, like in farmer fields, right? It's a mm -hmm. motor that you space, and that, that's what's holding us up in the air. I'm like, holy shit, they put <laughs> propellers on it, we're flying this thing. I didn't know that, right? And I got a briefing from the pilots on that. And so we were actually maxed out with four operators, all our body armor, you know, weapons and stuff like that. They're like, we got to chop weight so this thing stays aloft. And we were literally stripping avionics out of the helicopter. Okay, you don't need that. You don't need this. Get that out. Get that out. Get that out. And in fact, two of the helicopters, the four, it's like, hey, you know what? We don't need two pilots. You're out of here. You know, <laughs> we had two helicopters with one pilot and two with two pilots. Um, all, all of the operators, we literally didn't even bring any water in. We just tried to trim as much weight as we could so we could land these helicopters. And it still wasn't. We were still weren't able to just land them. We had to actually sink the helicopters in very slowly onto the roof. So as we're approaching, guys, if you're not following me over on Instagram, my personal page is at Julian D. Dory, and the podcast page is at Julian Dory Podcast. Both links are in the description below. I'm trying to build that out. I've never focused on it before, but it's important that obviously I get the fans over there because we announce a lot of things pertaining to the show. So I hope to see you follow me there. Check the links in the description. 
and we're literally sinking the helicopter on the fourth story of this prison. I remember, you know, at this point, all hell has broken loose. There's gunfire everywhere. I mean, people are dying. It's like cr complete chaos. And, uh, and I noticed as we're coming down, I saw a group of about four women and running out in the street, a couple of them holding babies. And in the middle of the four women was a, a, a man. And he was part of the uh, what they call the dignitary battalion. He was a militiaman, right? And so I can remember him very vividly. He was wearing blue jeans, a white guaya bearer, brown uh, brown type of hiking boots. He had an AK forty uh, S short uh, uh, um, AK forty seven. Uh, I still remember he was probably about five foot eight, uh, one hundred ninety pounds. And you know how? How can I remember all the details? Because. Um, when something's very emotional, you tend to remember it much longer, all the mm. details, right? And so this is a pretty emotional period right now. <laughs> People are dying and shit's happening. And so as they're running out in the center of the street, I think probably a distance from my barrel to his nug noggin was about maybe 30 yards. And uh, he had his AK-47 up, and he was using the women and kids as he was backing up as a shield. Mm. And he, was, and he, he hadn't leveled the weapon at me yet or in my helicopter because he was still kind of moving. And as they were crossing the street... Um, there was a cemetery and the cemetery had like a four foot wall, but the entranceway was like an arch, um, that you could walk through and, uh, they were all kind of moving to that together in a cluster. And I already had them in my sights. Um, I had 8.2 thousand, I had the dot on his, on his forehead. I could have took the shot, but you know, I didn't take the shot. And the reason I didn't take the shot because I was able to, you know, with all the excitement, I was still able to discern, listen, if you take that shot, it, that round will go through his melon and it will probably hit the woman and child behind him. Okay. Oh. And so, you know, and I said, he's not an immediate threat, although the weapon's up, it's not shouldered, it's not leveled. He's not taking aim yet. He's still moving. I said, I still have you're time. You're able to make that whole calculation. Yeah. Wow. That's what you're trained to do, right? That's why you're selected. So. And how far away were you again? Maybe 30 yards max. Uh, but that's kind of, and you were able to tell. Wow. Yeah, and I'm, I'm at a, and I'm at, you know, a duff lay position shooting down at him as the helicopter's sinking. Do, 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 do. I hadn't shot yet, right? Yeah. I mean, not him yet. And so. But that's how it's going to let you're basically, it's like a drive by. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, plunging fire going straight down. So, but something told me, man, just wait. He's not going to shoot yet. But when they go through that arch, somehow I knew, I don't know how I knew, but somehow I knew. That the women with the babies would all button hook to the left and he would button hook to the right and he would come over that wall. And damned if he didn't. That's exactly what happened. He came over the wall. Now he brought the weapon up and leveled it and, you know, I was waiting for him. So, you know, I sent him, uh, you know, I sent him uh, a hello and a goodbye. So, um, <laughs> and so, you know, and then the helicopter landed. I'll show you what hell looks like, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but the, where I was going with all that was you have to be able to make those critical decisions under pressure, under stress, and you got to make good decisions, right? Because you have to live with them, right? If I took that shot and let's say the helicopter buckled and I hit, you know, any number of those women or kids, you know, I got to live with that, you know? And you have to ask yourself, was that shot, was it worth taking that shot at that moment in time? And sometimes the answer is yes, because if I don't take that shot and he well, shoots and shoots my helicopter down, guess what? You may have four or five fathers on this aircraft oh, yeah. whose kids need them, mm -hmm. right? And boom, you know, so, you know, it's, you got to weigh all that out. That's a tough decision to oh, make, my God. you know, yeah. and uh, there's no right answer for it other than, you know, the man on the ground, you know, you, you know, you got to make that. And this is why we go through this very intense training. Um to make sure that we can make those, you know, those uh, high pressure decisions, especially when, you know, the fight or flight reflex is setting in and you got tunnel vision, you loss of depth perception, tachycardia, and all these things are kicking in. You know, you've got to be able to work through all of that and still make a, a good shot um, under pressure and still keep a circle of awareness about you and know what's going on. I still have to be aware that, hey, I'm landing on a roof and there might be a dude down there getting ready to shoot me in the face when I get off the helicopter, right? So there's a lot of the process at one time. And this is why, again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. They picked the, they picked the right man, not the best man. Um, mm. And this is why it's one of the most difficult selection courses in the world. It ain't all about being physical. It's very physical. Um, but the whole idea is to break you down physically. No matter how physical you are, they're going to break you down. They want to see how this functions under pressure. Oh, yeah. So... Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.